morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to All First Presbyterian Church and to those in our virtual community. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today and worship and honor our Lord. May God bless you. Please let us stand for our call to worship. God's spirit is moving amongst us. Give thanks. Our God, God is about to do a thing. new thing in our God has done great things for us, and we are glad. We are waiting to hear what God will have us to do. So forget what lies behind. We press on our new spiritual in Christ. Amen.
Lord, a praise just for trusting him today, yes. trusting him in all that we do. No matter what's going on, no matter what we hear in the news, no matter what we see or what the politicians or even what the high courts may do, we can always believe that God is going to turn it around for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
Let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands. Let's give him some praise. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I'll be reading this morning Psalm 27, triumphant song of confidence of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doors assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Through an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. Yes. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter. In a day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry out loud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. O God of my salvation, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breeding out violence. I believe that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. For the battle is not yours, but mine, says the Lord. The battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. The battle. Trustee CV, God bless you. So, Sister Solomon Akambi, thank you for the reading of the scripture today. I believe that Elder April Booker Russell has an event for the youth and the children this morning, so they are leaving worship now to go to Burr Hall. I believe she has a special something going on over there, so as they leave this morning, she has something for them over in Burr Hall this morning. God bless you. It's good to see so many of you here, amen. Amen, amen, as we celebrated our achievements on last week. So good to see you back today, amen. God bless you, young people. God bless you, Elder April. God bless you, Deacon James, and all of the youth that are going this morning. God bless you, that's good, so good to see them. And good to see you again on this morning. 
We give God thanks and praise for you and all of you who are joining us in our virtual community this morning online. God bless you. It is good to see you today. Amen. I know it's hot. It is hot today. This is, I think it's supposed to get up into the, well into the 80s today. It's been a hot weekend, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna say what we have to say as the Spirit is leading us, and then we're going to get out of here and let you go enjoy your 4th of July Independence Celebration weekend. Amen? Amen. Now, we just celebrated Juneteenth two weeks ago. Uh, people of color, African Americans, we celebrated a national holiday of Juneteenth when the last slaves were freed in Texas, amen? Some two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. But on this weekend, we celebrate the independence of our nation, the United States of America. <clears throat> Those of you who have traveled out of the United States, as I have, and to other countries, you still know that the United States is the greatest nation in the world. Amen? We have our faults. We're not perfect. We have a long way to go. But if you traveled in other places and other nations, you will come back to the U.S. and you will still say, I believe that this is the greatest nation. You may not agree with me, <laughs> but I'm U.S. born. Amen? So God bless you this morning. I want to invite you very quickly to turn with me to this powerful passage of scripture this morning. I got goosebumps when I was reading this and studying this today. Exodus chapter 14. I know the bulletin says we're going to start at verse 10, but we're actually going to start at verse 1 in, um, in uh, Exodus chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 1. And so join me. Open your Bibles. Genesis, Exodus, the second book in the Torah. Open your Bibles, your, open up your, your uh, devices, whatever you use to read the Bible. Maybe it might be your smartphone, your iPhone, the Bible. And let's read, uh, listen, follow along as I read this great, powerful text this morning. God will fight for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and to encamp near Pi Haroth between Migdal, Migdal and the sea. And they are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Now when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. Isn't that something? So, he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with the officers over all of them. He took his best. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Haroth, opposite Baal Zephon. 
As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this desert. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you, you need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, when I gain glory through Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Final verse. Then the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of the Israelite army, withdrew and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. What a powerful, powerful reminder in the scriptures today that the Lord will fight for us just like he fought for his people Israel. Can you say amen? Amen. Let us pray. Conquering, 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 loving, protecting God. It is in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we come today. Lord, on this independence, U.S. independence, 4th of July celebration, we come thanking you and praising you that all throughout time, through the beginning of time, you have always, always fought for your people. And so we thank you today, oh God, for this precious and wonderful and timely reminder that we have nothing to fear, that if you are for us, you are more than all the world against us. And so thank you, God. May our hearts be strengthened. May our resolve be be boldened as we hear your word today. And may we leave this place saying, our God is an awesome God. He reigns. He reigns. He reigns. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray this morning, let the hearts of the people of God say amen. 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 God bless you. With all of the news coverage that we heard on last week, around all of these major events like the Supreme Court's ruling on abortion, climate change, the news coverage on that 16-wheeler down in Texas that was loaded with those migrants or immigrants trying to cross the border and when they opened it, all of them were dead. They suffocated in the back of the in the back of the 16-wheeler. And and all of this news and stuff on this past week, you may have missed a very historical event that happened on last Thursday. Anybody know what that was? Katanji. Amen. (laughs) Katanji Brown Jackson was sworn in 
in the 116th Supreme Court Justice and the first black African American woman to serve on the highest court in the land. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. You may have missed it with all the other stuff that made headline news. The ceremony was the culmination of months long, a months long process that began back in February of this year when President Biden did what he promised. He promised that he would nominate the first African American woman, the first black woman to the Supreme Court, and he kept his promise. He announced Katanji Brown Jackson would be his pick to replace Justice Stephen Breyer, who officially retired on last Thursday, which paved the way for Katanji Brown Jackson to be sworn in. If you saw the swearing in ceremony on TV, or you can pull it up on YouTube, or you can Google it, you will notice that Chief Justice Jackson, that Justice Jackson was sworn in and she had her left hand, her left hand rested on two Bibles, it was a stack of Bibles, it was two Bibles, and her left hand rested on two stacks of Bibles while she held up her right hand. And those Bibles, two Bibles, were held by her husband, the Dr. Patrick Jackson. One was her family Bible, her family Bible. The other was the Bible that the Supreme Court uses, donated by Justice John Marshall Harlan. That's a story behind that. It's finally done, beloved. We have the first black female justice in the US Supreme Court. But her confirmation did not come easy. It was not easy for Katanji. She got raked over the coals. Did you all see the confirmation hearings? She was raked over the coals by some of the mentally challenged conservative senators on the Judicial Committee. The vote was 53 to 44. All 50 Senate Democrats, including the two independents and three Republicans, voted in favor of her confirmation, but her confirmation hearings were not easy. What the naysayers failed to realize is that Katanji Brown Jackson was born for this, for such a time as this. God had been preparing her from the time she was a little child and all along the way, for every battle that she had to endure, God fought for Katanji. Amen? You have to hear her story. It may look easy now, but to be the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court justice has a backstory. It was not an easy road for her. And in every time and place when men and women that God has called have stood firm and fast and remained positive in the face of adversity and incredible pressures that would make some of us want to jump and run, God has in the background or in the foreground, God has fought for them. What did or do they know? that they can teach us today. What is in their character? From where do they get their resolve to be able to stand so strong and be so positive in adverse conditions? I believe that they knew and they know that God is on their side. Amen? 
men such as Nelson Mandela and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and the great Congressman John Lewis and, and Raphael Warnock, the senator from Georgia, the first African-American senator from Georgia. Women such as Fannie Lou Hamer and Rosa Parks and Patrice Coolors, who is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, and Stacey Abrams, a civil rights and voting rights activist. I believe they knew and they know that God is on their side. Likewise, Old First Presbyterian Church, Newark, as we are in this process of transitioning from my pastoral leadership to new pastoral leadership, there are some things that we absolutely must know and do. Amen? We must absolutely, we must trust God's purpose. If you recall from the Exodus narrative, the people of God were not in the wilderness by accident. They didn't just get lost coming out of Egypt and they wound up and camped by the Red Sea in the valley between Pihoroth and Migdal, directly opposite Baal Zephor. God specifically told Moses to take those three million Israelites on a path that would lead them to the Red Sea. Why in the world would God do that? Why would God tell Moses to take these newly emancipated, shaky, fresh Israelites to the worst possible location if you're trying to escape the Egyptians? This was not an intelligent, strategic, military move in the natural mind. This location, this location is in a low valley between two mountains, and it led right to the Red Sea. Once you went into that groove in the valley, there was no way out except go through the Red Sea or turn around and go back the way you came. In other words, it was a death trap. At least Pharaoh thought so because in verse 3, he laughed. Can you see Pharaoh laughing when he is informed that the Israelites are in the valley between Pi-Horoth and, and Migdal uh, by the Red Sea? Can you just see him doing a belly laugh? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> They so stupid. <laughs> Can you just see them? The Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. But way back in Exodus 13, God led, told Moses to lead the people through the desert towards the Red Sea. The directive that God gave to Moses makes no sense at all unless you understand, listen, unless you understand that God had a purpose and God has a purpose for everything that God does. Amen? Has God ever directed you to do something or to follow a path that made no sense at all to your natural mind? Do I have any witnesses here today? Amen. I've heard some of your testimonies. I know God has. Back in the early years of my ministry, when I first started, I'm celebrating, what, 21 years of ministry, full in ministry. Amen. Praise God. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. I recall back when I was new and fresh and green in the ministry, right? We all have those. And I was doing home visitations, especially for the sick and the shut-in members of the congregation. It was, it was my practice to go to their home, take communion to those who couldn't come to church. That was my practice. And there was this one elderly member who lived in a neighborhood that was a little shady, a little shady neighborhood. She had lived in that same house for over 50 years. And it was probably a very, very nice neighborhood when she bought her home. But she'd been there 50 years, and over the years, the community has deteriorated. You know how that happens. 
And one of her older sons lived at home with her. You know, the son that never left home, you know, the 60-year-old that's living in mama's basement, you know, never left home, spotty work record. So I, I kind of avoided going to her house to serve communion. Uh, uh, but this elderly lady got really sick. She got really sick. I mean, like, sick unto death. And God, one morning in the church office, God directed me to take her communion. I heard the Holy Spirit say, you need to take communion to this elderly person. And I was really reluctant to go, you know, because, you know, the neighborhood, you know. But I felt the spirit urgency to, to do that. So right in the middle of the morning, I got my communion set together. I got the bread and I got the grape juice together and got my little communion set together. And I went to this lady's home all by myself. When I got there, her adult son let me in the house and she was sitting in the chair and she was semi awake. She was in and out of sleep. You know, she was on heavy medications, in and out of sleep. So I told her who I was and why I was there and she nodded. I said, I'm pastor and she nodded and I was able to serve her communion as best I could, you know. And I quickly served her communion and I was ready to go. Ready to go. I was like, okay, I'm done. I, Lord, I did what you told me. And then her intoxicated son, the one who let me in the house, came from another room and stood in my way. And he said, I want communion. And I thought to myself, I said, you already been communing with somebody because I smell alcohol on your breath and this little grape juice I got here ain't nothing compared to what you've been drinking. I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. And he looked at me as if I was a pork chop on the menu. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And I was really uncomfortable. I was really uncomfortable. And so I moved a little, you know, to the side, and he wouldn't move. And even though I attempted to move around him, you know, we was doing this little dance. When I moved, he moved. He said, I want communion. And my thoughts were, God, why in the world would you tell me to come down here to this house? Now this drunk acts like he's going to accost me. And I put on my best brave face and I stood up real straight and I spoke assertively, but I was shaking, my knees were knocking, I was, I was afraid, I was scared. He didn't move, he just kept coming in closer. Just then, as I was about to try to make a run for it, right, I was gonna, I was gonna leave that communion box and everything, I was, I was gonna try to make a run for that door. I heard keys in the door. The door opened, his sister, this woman's daughter, entered the house, and she gave him a killer look. If looks could kill you, she gave him a killer look, and he retreated somewhere in that house. He just got out of there as fast as he could. And I spoke to her, and I, and I, I said, oh, it's so good to see you. She didn't know I was so good to see her. And, and, and then I, I, you know, I bid her goodbye, and, and then I got out of there as fast as I could, shaky, shaky. And I was like, Lord, why in the world are you sitting me down here? God wanted to teach me something. The first lesson I learned was never, ever, ever go do a home visitation by yourself. I learned that early in ministry. And now whenever I would go do visitations, I always had an elder, a deacon, or somebody with me. Amen? Amen. Never, never go into folks' house and do a visitation alone. That's the first thing God wanted me to see. That woman died shortly after my visit. And that was her final communion. And so God wanted to test me and make sure that I would be obedient when the Holy Spirit spoke. But God will fight for you if God ever tells you to do something and it makes no sense to you. In fact, some of you might be in a wilderness experience right now. And you're wondering, God, why would you allow this to happen? God, why am I in this place today? 
Perhaps God's purpose for your life might be to lead you into that wilderness so that God can prove God's self mighty on your behalf. Because let me tell you, God will fight for you. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. That's a good place to give the Lord a hand praise. Oh, First Church, what I'm trying to tell you is that you must trust that God is on your side and you must trust God's purpose for your life and for this church community. Amen? Not only do you have to trust God's purpose, you got to trust God's plan. Now, a purpose and a plan are not the same thing. I know we use them interchangeably. See, the purpose is the reason for which something is done. But the plan is how it's carried out. You follow me? The plan is the detail. You see, beloved, God has a purpose, a motivation, a justification for why God does what God does in our lives. But God also has a plan. God has the details. We may not have the details, but God has the details. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, 13 says, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare, for you to have a, a good welfare and not to harm you and to give you a future and a hope. God knows the details. Notice in Exodus 14 again, God gave Moses very specific details. Go this way, camp over here, go there by this place. He gave them names and places. God told him how he was going to deliver the people of Israel and punish the Egyptians for years of injustice towards his people. God was not sitting up in heaven scratching his head trying to figure out the plan for Israel, nor is God confused about your life. God is not confused or anxious or worried or depressed or distressed. We do that. God's not that. God said, I know, I know the plan that I have for you. I know the plan that I have for Old First Church. Our task is to trust that God knows what we need and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. You all know Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 6? Say it with me. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Amen? God led Abraham to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his only son Isaac. God had a purpose and a plan and it was called a ram in the bush. Amen? God led husbandless and childless Ruth and Naomi back to Bethlehem because God had a plan and a purpose and the plan's name was Boaz. Amen? God led Esther to speak up and to go to the king unsummoned because God had a plan and a purpose and it was called Goodbye Haman. And God allowed Jesus to die at Calvary because God had a purpose and a plan and it is called salvation. Amen? We must not only trust God for our lives individually, but we must trust God for this church community. God knows what God is doing at Old First Church. These men and women in the scripture in our contemporary times could and do stand up in the face of all kind of crazy persecution and remain positive and powerful under pressure. Katanji endured all kinds of political and racial abuse, but look at her now. Amen? We cannot do God's will in our own strength. We must, oh first, listen, we must trust God's purpose and we must trust God's plan. And finally, we must trust God's provision. Say provision. Look at God's provision in Exodus 14. Well, really starting way back in 12 and 13. 
He gave them a pillar of fire to guide the people by night and to keep them warm because it gets really cold in the desert at night. Pillar of fire. Guide them, give them light at night. Keep them warm in the desert. God provided a cloud to cover them from the heat of the day. It gets really, really hot in the desert during the day. A cloud, a cloud cover to keep that blistering heat off of them. And then a fog between the Egyptian army and the Israelites. You notice God moved, moved that cloud not in front of them, but he moved it behind them. Amen? Did you, did you, get, did you catch that? So that they, the Egyptians could not see the fog blurred their vision and they couldn't figure out what was going on while all night long the Israelites were crossing over on dry land. You see, God's got your front, come on now, and God's got your back, amen? You don't have to worry about it. God's got you coming, God's got you going, amen? Amen. We do our part. Our part is to pray and seek God and listen, stay in unity. Stay in unity, O oh first, and God will do God's part. After, who, who said that? Donnie McClurkin. After you've done all you can, you just stand. Just stand still and see the glory of the Lord. God will provide what we need for to do God's will because where God guides, listen, where God guides, God provides. Amen? Look with me again at verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back and they saw the Egyptians advancing on them. And in great fear, they cried out to the Lord and then they jumped on Moses. They jumped on the leader. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you took us out here into this wilderness to die? What'd you bring us out here for? We could have died in Egypt. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die out here. Don't that sound just like some church folk, right? Sound just like some of us. See, God is trying to bring us into a new chapter in our lives, a new beginning, new opportunity. And we keep looking back and talking back and thinking back, talking about dying in Egypt and eating leeks and onions. Leave us alone. God is trying to take us forward. He said, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to go forward. And that's my message today, oh, first, go forward. Not backwards. Forward, not back to Egypt, forward into what God has planned for you. Amen? Listen, listen. Listen, oh, first, recall your history and how God has fought for you since the day this, commun this congregation, its inception. 354 something odd years. I've been here for four years. In the past four years, I have been, since I've been your transitional interim, I have seen God fight for this congregation. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. When others tried to undermine and disrespect the chosen leadership, hold hostage the church's finances, divide this beautiful congregation, I saw God work mightily on behalf of this congregation. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. God provided the people and the resources for the victory that puts this church in the positive position that you are in today. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. God will fight for you. Amen. What is this? What, what is this? You all see this? It's microwave popcorn. Y'all buy that microwave popcorn, you just stick it in the microwave, right? Now you all would think I was crazy if I opened this bag and I just started eating these kernels out the bag, right? You're like, wow, Pastor Betty, that's weird. That's really creepy. 
You eat the kernels right out the pop, um, pop kernels. Y'all like, I love popcorn. But you can learn a lesson from this bag of popcorn, right? It starts off with these little hard kernels, these little hard kernels, and then they tell you to put this side up, stick it in the microwave. Now, I don't know anybody who would eat these hard kernels out of the bag like this. But when you put a little heat on this, come on now, you stick this in the microwave, and you put a little heat on it, and then the kernels start pop. And they get all fluffy and white, right? And the bag begins to the, ba the bag begins to open up, right? And then when it's over, out comes a bag of fluffy, white, delicious, buttery <laughs> popcorn. You see, God knows what's in us. And just like this popcorn, sometimes God has to add a little heat to see what comes out. If you really want to know what's in a person, just add a little heat. Amen? When you add a little heat, what's in them will come out. Amen? Moses told the people, don't be afraid. I'm telling you, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish in you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you will never see them again. I, the Lord, listen, I, the Lord, will fight for you. You have only to keep still. I know that these times of transition are difficult and unsettling and sad. For some of you, some of you might be glad to see me go. <laughs> I don't know. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> Amen. But, but. I know it's a little unsettling. It's a little unsettling. When, when, when you've gotten used to a person and, and then they're leaving. But listen, God is teaching you and me to trust God above all else. God is teaching us that God can make a way out of no way. God can open doors that no man can close. God can close doors that no man can open. God is leading you and me, amen? God is leading us to new opportunities and new leadership. I'm looking forward to the next journey that God has for me and Pastor Phil. It's not that we don't love O First. We love O First. But God is leading us on the next journey. So don't be afraid, O First. God is with you, and God will fight for you. God will walk beside you. And just like God led me here in August of 2018, God has, I believe, I've been praying, we've been praying, you've been praying, I believe that God has already touched the heart of your new pastor and is leading them to you and that will be just the right person. Amen? Amen. To take you to the next level of your journey. Do not be afraid. Katanji Brown Jackson said uh, at her appointment, when she was appointed the black, first black woman, uh, when she was selected by uh, President Biden, she said, it has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we made it. We made it, all of us have made it. At the noon ceremony on last Thursday at the Supreme Court, Katanji took two oaths. She raised her hand, put her left hand on top of two Bibles, and she took two oaths. She took a constitutional oath, and she took a, judi a judicial oath. But based on her life story, what I've read about her life story and her journey that she shared, I believe that Supreme Court now, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson had already taken the most important oath in her life. As for me and my house, come on, 
we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Oh, First Church, we must trust God's purpose, God's plan, and God's provision. And if you're not doing that, the day is a good day to start. Right now, God bless you. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to say our Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin. So if you don't know it by heart, you can just read it. So let's all stand and let's reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. There are several um, persons here this morning who have expressed a desire to unite in membership with Old First Presbyterian Church. And we are delighted this morning to um, introduce or reintroduce them to you. Uh, they, they have come already. Brother Jesse, if you'll just stand up and wave at us. Brother Jesse is, a, is an ordained um, deacon or elder? Ordained uh, deacon from another, he was ordained at another Presbyterian church. He has expressed a desire to be united with Old First Presbyterian Church. We have the clerk of the session, Elder April Booker Russell, has called his former church, talked to that clerk, and they told us that he is in good standing. He didn't, yay man, he didn't, he, he didn't do nothing. He's in good standing, and, and, with, our, and with their blessings, uh, we are going to receive Brother Jesse, not this morning, at a, but he will not be going through a membership class, amen? He doesn't need to go through a membership class, amen? So Brother Jesse, in a couple, of, we're going to get together on one of these Sundays in the next week or so, we're going to give you the right hand of fellowship and bring you in as a member of Old First Church with all the rights and privileges of any other member of this church. God bless you, Brother Jesse. The other, you may be see the other two individuals, uh, Janicia and Br Brother George. Would you stand up, please? Would you come forward? Would you come forward? Janicia's in the other room, right? Uh, Deacon Gigi, would you go get her? We need her. She has to be here. <laughs> they expressed a desire. Uh, the, they came to us. Uh, Elder uh, Eric uh, Abroqua, their friends or neighbors of him, and. He's been testifying and talking about what a great church this is and invited them to come to worship and they came and they got hooked. Amen. <laughs> he and his daughter were both here on last week and helped with the grab and go for two days in a row they were here. And so they have expressed a desire to be a part of this congregation. And so uh, they uh, will be, I will be spending some time with them Janicia and George in as we prepare for the new members class and we are going to take them in before I leave amen <laughs> going to give them the right hand of fellowship we'll probably do it all on the same day but they're going to come in and go through our new members class and spend some time with me do you have anything you want to say George or Janicia I know Janicia is kind of quiet she's kind of shy I just want you to see who they were brother George you want to you want to say anything You're not going to get her to say anything. Would you like to say something, Brother George? Amen. Amen. And so, beloved, our practice is that new members go through a four-week new members class with me. 
and then they'll come back before this body and they will receive the right hand of fellowship from this congregation and be entitled to all the rights and privileges of any other member of this congregation. So we're going to set that up, get that done before I leave. We'll probably do it all on the same day, Jesse. Bring all three of you guys in. It'll be a glorious celebration. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Janicia. You can go back. <laughs> Thank you, Brother George. God bless you. All right. I want to take a moment to invite others. Maybe there's somebody out there in virtual church or somebody in this sanctuary. And maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've lived all of your life and you've gone to church. You've paid your tithes. You may even sing on the choir or serve on the office. But you don't know Christ. You never committed your life to Christ. That's what this is all about this morning. This is an invitation to know Jesus Christ. I thank God for people who want to be members of the congregation. But being members of a congregation do not save you. Did you hear me? Being members of a congregation, having your name on a church roll does not save you. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. Amen? So if you're out there this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if there has never been a time in your life where you have Jesus Christ to come into your life to come into your heart forgive you of your sins to cleanse you up from the inside out and make you a part of his wonderful wonderful large blessed family I want to invite you to come now virtual land here in person I want to invite you to come to know Christ as your Savior first and foremost number one number one And if you're with us and you don't have a church home, whether you're in virtual land or in person, I certainly want to invite you to make Old First Church your church home. We got a home everything, home this and a home that, a home page. We need a home church, amen? I want to invite you to make Old First your home church, the place where you worship, the place where people know you. The place where the pastor and the congregation can embrace you, where we can learn together and study together and cry together and fellowship and celebrate together and grow together. You don't have a church home and you'd like to be a part of the old First Church family, reach out to us via our social media. I invite you to come. God bless you this morning. I'm going to ask now that we prepare to receive uh, Holy Communion, this is our first Sunday. I'm going to ask that you prepare to receive communion. I'm going to ask the deacons to come now and as you prepare to give out the sets. And I ask the praise and worship and the choir members to come as we prepare to sing. Remember, I know the plans I have, I know. Thank you. 
Beloved, God bless you. According to our polity, as you all know, only the children who have been confirmed take communion. So if you've given children communion and they haven't been confirmed yet, then they, sh they uh, should not, according to our church polity, Presbyterian polity, um, communion is for those who have been confirmed. So I just wanted to um, lift that up. Um, so if you have not been confirmed, and if you don't know if you've been confirmed, then you haven't. Because <laughs> if you were confirmed, you'd know it, especially under my leadership. If you've been confirmed, you would know it. 
Uh, so just keep that in mind as we prepare for communion. Has everyone who wants to take communion been served? Everybody have, have who wants? Uh, the choir members don't have, the praise team and the choir members don't have communion sets? Elders, deacons? We are still using the pre-prepared communion sets. We hope maybe in the very near future, um, depending on what the session and the leadership says, that we can go back to using bread and um, the actual bread and grape juice or wine. Uh, but that will be a decision of your session under the leadership of your new pastor. But we are still using these little, I know they're not the best, but um, we're still using these little um, individual packets. The wafer is at the top. It has a thin uh, little sheet on it. So if you pull it back, you'll see the little wafer. And then the juice is up under that, which requires another pulling back. Don't worry if you drop it. Try not to spill it. But the deacons, we have plenty. They'll give you another one if you drop it. Just raise your hand and they'll give you another one. Deacons, be alert. Because sometimes it's easy to drop these little things. All right, beloved, we are here to take Holy Communion on this 4th of July weekend. And the scripture says, friends, um, this is the holy feast of the people of God. They will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south. And will sit at table in the kingdom of God. And according to the gospel of Luke... When the Lord was at table, the scripture says that our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was at table, you just hold your communion set right now. The scripture says he, he took bread. I have this little flat loaf of bread, very simple. You know, the gospel is very simple. Whosoever will, let him come. The Bible says he took bread. And it says he broke it blessed it and he broke it and he told his disciples this is my body which is broken for you he said as often as you eat this he said remember me and in the same manner after the supper the scripture says that Jesus took the cup blessed it and he said this cup is the cup of the new covenant my blood shed for you. And as often as you drink it, Jesus said, remember me. Beloved children of God, saints of the most high God, victorious more than conqueror saints of God. As often as we eat this bread and receive this cup, we do show forth Christ's death, his burial and his resurrection until he comes again. These are the gifts of God and they are for the people of God. And you say amen. Amen. So let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless, may it be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all our brothers and sisters who share this feast, united in ministry, united in heart in every place. We thank you for inviting us to this table where we have get the opportunity to know your presence in Christ, get the opportunity to receive your gifts, strengthen our faith, Increase our love for one another. Let us show forth your praise in our lives. Jesus Christ, our Lord, that the people of God say amen. 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 So now you want to get your bread. If you get that little wafer, if you can get that off right now, and you hold it up. Amen. Hold up that little wafer on this 4th of July Independence Weekend. And let us eat together, symbolizing the body of Christ. Let's eat together. Body of Christ.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now get your, pull that other little film back. Don't spill it on yourself. Get that grape juice. This is the cup of salvation. Let us drink together. Cup of salvation. Cup of salvation. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who lives, the one who's coming back again. Well, we thank you so much, oh God. Thank you for this powerful word today, reminding us that you fight for us. Uh, what have we to fear? Oh, you are our rock. You are our fortress. You are our guide. Through ages past, through present and through the future. You promise never to leave us alone. All we have to do is lean and depend on you, trust in you with all of our hearts and not try to figure everything out ourselves. Trust in you and you will direct our path, not just individually, but as a church. And so Lord, we thank you today for this reaffirmation and confirmation that you will fight for us. You're looking out for us. You got us covered, and we thank you. Thank you for these gifts of bread and wine as we commune with you again one more time. We do this on this side of heaven, but one day is coming when we're going to sit at table with you in the heavenlies, and the Sabbath will have no end. Every day will be Sunday, and we will commune with you without end. And until that day, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to break bread and symbolizing your broken body for us and receive the cup symbolizing the bread, the blood that you shed at Calvary for us. We are so blessed. Oh, God, I ask that you would bless everyone under the sound of my voice this morning. I ask that you would keep us strong and keep us faithful and keep us healthy. Thank you for the opportunity to come to this table today. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Let every heart say amen. 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 I'm going to ask the deacons to pick up the, the, uh, the trash. Um, can somebody, Elder, would you go get Julio Romero, our building superintendent? Would you ask him to come in here? We're going to take a moment to pray. And Mr. Julio, who is our building superintendent... Everybody knows Julio, right? Wonderful, wonderful man. He is on his way to Spain. He's on his way to Spain, Madrid, Spain, for the rest of the month. He won't be back until the end of July. So we want to pray for him. Because the last time we let Julio go to Spain, Julio didn't come back for three weeks. <laughs> it wasn't his fault. He went in January, and it was a huge snowstorm in Madrid, and he got stuck over there, and all the flights were canceled, and he couldn't get back, and so it wasn't his fault. But we just want to lift up a prayer for him. We love him so much. He's just our building superintendent. He does everything. Amen. He works for us. He's a part of our family, and we just want to pray for him before he goes uh, off to Spain. I want to lift up prayers for all of those things that are on your heart today as well. Whatever you're challenged with. Thank you for our visitor all the way from South Carolina. Charleston. Charlotte. Charlotte. Charlotte all the way from Charlotte, South Carolina. Amen. Thank you for being with family. You're so right. Family's so important. We have to stay connected. We have to stay with family. I want to pray for Brother Jim over there. Raise your hand, Brother Jim. He is taking his law exams. He's a lawyer. He's going to be a lawyer soon. I don't know what kind of law. What kind of law are you? What kind of law? Something honest and righteous. <laughs> he is right in the thick of his law exams. And so that's why you haven't seen very much of him. He is studying for those law exams. And I heard that they, they are something. Brother Julio, we're going to pray for you. Where are you? Come on around here. Come on. Don't be shy. I told him the last time we let you go to Madrid, you didn't come back for three weeks. 
<laughs> no fault of your own. You, you got stuck over there. So we want to pray for him as he takes off to go be with his family and get away from us for a minute because we work him so hard over here. We want to pray for him to have safe travel to Madrid and back. And Brother Jim, if you'll stand up, we want to pray for you right where you are as well. And we just want to ask God to just be with him. Thank God for Brother uh, Dr. Cumlin's family, his elder sister and his brother-in-law with him. They're still back with us. Amen. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. And for all of those situations and concerns, I don't know what they are, but you all know what they are. We thank God for Dr. Bug back here with us in his seat. In his seat. That's his seat. <laughs> we look up. He's there. Amen. God brought him through that little crisis. We thank God for him for healing. So, beloved, now let's pray. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Let's pray for Julio. Jim, take a note. He's going to pass those law exams the first time. The first time. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for this opportunity to come before you in prayer. Oh, God, in all that we say and do, we understand that there is power. There is power in prayer. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. You, we, your children, get to call on your name, get to call on the God of heaven, the one who created the sun, the moon, the stars, who calls every star by name, who knows the number of hairs on our heads, who knows the number of sand on the seashores, an almighty God, an omnipotent God, an all-knowing, all-seeing God. It is to you that we come this morning. Thank you, oh God for this opportunity. We don't have to pray. We get to pray. It's a wonderful privilege. We pray for our brother, Julio Romero, as he prepares to go back to, to home, to Madrid, to see his family, his, his siblings, and all of his family members that he's left there. We ask to give him safe travel to and from. Don't let him get stuck anywhere, oh God. And bring him back safely to us, oh God. We thank you for him. For Brother Jim, as he's studying for those law exams, oh God, give him a special measure. Give him wisdom and discernment, oh God. Bring everything back to his remembrance as he's studying to prepare to take those exams. Let him pass those exams the first time so that he can be a lawyer, a righteous and just lawyer. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for him. For all of our visitors who have come under our refuge, our gates this morning, thank you, God, for for them today bless bless them in their travel bless them as they visit with family and friends keep them safe oh God as they are here with us in our gates oh God let us practice radical hospitality to those who have come under our gates and our roof uh, this day oh God we thank you and for all of those under the sound of my voice every member every supporter all of those in virtual community Oh, God, meet us at the point of our need, individually, uniquely, and specifically, as only you can. God, you know us. You formed us, oh, God. You know our, you know our uprising. You know our down-sitting. You know our thoughts even before we speak them, oh, God. You know the motivations of our heart. You know what we need, oh, God. And you are committed. You are committed, oh, God, to meeting our need and to fighting for us, oh, God. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. We adore you. We cannot live without you. And we thank you this morning, oh, God. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever into eternity. Amen and beyond. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. God bless you. All right. All right. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stay. Yes, amen. Praise God. Amen. Beloved, I want to say to you the words that God spoke to Joshua. He said, keep this book of the law always on your lips. 
Meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and have good success. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Here's a part I like. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Beloved, God is with us. God has a purpose. God has a plan. And God certainly has a provision. So go in the strength of the Lord because the Lord will fight for you. Amen. 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 Amen.